How old was your dad when he found out he had terminal cancer? 48. I think he was 48, if memory serves. Um, yeah, I think he was around 48. And uh, he got diagnosed with renal cell carcinoma, which is a kidney cancer. They removed a softball-sized tumor off of his kidney. Um, he was a vegetarian, didn't drink, didn't smoke, you know, had a pretty healthy lifestyle, but just just gotten out of a really bad multi-year lawsuit uh, that caused a lot of stress, which probably probably helped out a lot, I'm sure. Um, but yeah, it was at the time they had given him eight months. And so we pushed up our wedding and, and everything. He ended up lasting eight years. He was a fighter for sure. He definitely fought uh, tooth and nail. And so ended up lasting about eight years on it, which was great. And where were you when you found out? It's funny. I actually remember exactly where I was. I was working at the video superstore in Orlando, Florida. And he called while I was on a shift. And I remember going out and sitting in the car on my lunch break, I think. And he told me about it. I remember, yeah, I remember it very vividly. Um, and it was just kind of like, oh, okay. You know, this this big hit of of what, uh, you know, kind of kind of how'd you reevaluate your lifestyle and your life at that point? Because you're kind of like, oh, wow, okay. And it makes you really realize really quickly how sacred life is, for sure. But I remember sitting in my 88 Suburban in that parking lot when he called and told us. And it was like, oh, okay. And then trying to figure out what to do from there. And when you walked back into the store, did the store look different in a way? Because your perspective... Now everything was turned upside down. I don't know if necessarily my perspective was completely turned upside down. It was more so of, okay, okay, like what do we do next? What's the next step? I'm definitely a very structured kind of person. So it's like, all right, if I have to accomplish something, what do I have to do to get there? Like, okay, what's next? We do surgery next. Okay, we do the surgery to remove the tumor. Okay, then what's after that? Then we start chemotherapy. Okay, so it's like, what's the plan to get to our goal of remission? So I think my mind was kind of more thinking that way than thinking about, oh, I'm going to go cry for an hour and a half, you know, and be sad. I think it was more so about, okay, here we are. What do we have to do to accomplish our goal to make to make this work, to make this better? Um, which of course you only have so much say in because <laughs> it's uh, it's a disease. But uh, and then they started the processes and you stuck around for another eight years. It was crazy. It was cool. How did that day impact his life and how did that day impact yours? He definitely made a lot of choices and changes after that. He moved back to his home state of Louisiana. He got closer to family over there. He ended up meeting... Um, a woman, Beth, who they started a relationship and she had a big farm and he started a farm, which he never had a farm before. We bought him goats for Christmas, I remember, or sheep, sheep, sheep and goats, because that was fun. And he started this farm. He was a lawyer and a judge for uh, years. And so he kind of took to this retirement. He would have to go to Houston to do chemotherapy and through the MD Anderson Center. And um, then after a few of those years, he started traveling, you know, trying to travel to places that he hadn't been to. He tried to kind of live live the best he could. He got remarried during that to Beth and, you know, lived as much as he could possibly do. But it was interesting because at the end, I have uh, two of my sisters and I went and stayed with them two weeks apart. So we each had two weeks with them. And I had the last two weeks and I was leaving because our short 222 was playing at Grumman's Chinese Theater here in Hollywood which was the first time I'd ever had a movie play in Hollywood, let alone at the Chinese theater. It was a huge, huge deal. And I was there with him for two weeks. And then I took a flight to Hollywood and met my wife. She flew out from Florida. We went to this whole red carpet, had this whole incredible experience, got meetings from studios and all this different stuff. I put her back on a flight the next day because I had set up a few days worth of meetings while I was there. And as soon as she got on the flight and left, I remember going back and I was just hanging out, just looking at the Hollywood sign, soaking everything in. And then I get a call saying he's not going to last the next day. So it was a really crazy experience. because It was like the highest and lowest point I think I'd ever experienced in the same time frame. And so I was like, well, okay. 
And so I went and booked a flight, you know, flew back to the small town in Louisiana that he was in, canceled all my meetings, canceled everything. And, um, and yeah, he passed away the next day. And so it was a crazy whirlwind for sure. Um, and what's, what's even crazier is uh, three months after that, my stepbrother ended up getting killed by an accidental shooting. And three months after that, my wife's mother died of cancer. So it was a very crazy year. Um, and also our son was born right after she passed away. A few months after she passed, he was born. But it really, you know, going back to the whole horror element, it really lit a fire to where it's like, all right, you know, your life is not guaranteed. Tomorrow's not guaranteed. Like you've got to get going. You got to make sure that everything you're doing is impacting the way that you want it to go and, and to help you reach this goal that you've set for yourself. And so, you know, soon after that, we moved out here and, and kind of changed the way we were doing things. And it's, it's been great. It's been wonderful, but it's that fire that kind of keeps, keeps pushing. Um, because yeah, it's, you never know. You know, and I've had friends that have passed away that are younger than me and stuff. And even during COVID, like we've had friends pass away from COVID that, you know, just didn't get, had, had their whole chance taken from them. And so like you see that and it's like, oh my gosh, you know, and then your monster really goes crazy because it doesn't want to die either. And you really kind of got to figure out what's, what's the best plan, you know, to get what you want and where you want to be. And once you decalculate all that, I feel like you, you use your secret decoder ring and see how the industry works. And you're kind of like, okay, this makes sense. This makes sense. This makes sense. You see what connects the dots. It does make it a little easier. Um, but it's still pretty hard. When you talked about a uh, passion, a passionate filmmaker versus an obsessed filmmaker, do at times you check yourself because you realize, wait a minute, okay, I've seen somebody who was who had a thriving career and, and other people that I've known pass away, how much is this really worth obsessing over? I'm definitely a workaholic. Like I like being busy. I like having a lot of stuff going on at the same time. Um, though I get frazzled also too because of it. And I have a family, I have an 11 year old son. So it's trying to find that, that work-life balance of being there for your family and then also continuing to push to be able to get to where you want to be. And it's definitely challenging at times. There's some, I mean, I just went away for, I was six weeks on the road uh, doing shoots and then had to go home for some family stuff for a couple of weeks. And so even then it was like six weeks away from home is, is tough. And then you're trying to figure out, okay, well, I've got two hours a night of downtime that I could try to write something or try to put something else together. Like while I'm on this trip or I'm on a plane for five hours, what can I get done while I'm on the plane? Which most of the time you just watch movies cause you're exhausted and you don't, you don't want to do anything. But it's, it's trying to find that balance and, and also still enjoying things. You know, you don't want to work yourself to death to where you're 80 years old looking back being like, oh man, I shouldn't have, you know, killed myself writing those 37 scripts when I could have just gone out and gone camping for the weekend or something with my family. And I think it's important to find that, to find that balance. It's not always easy to find it, um, but you're always trying. You're always trying to find it, I think. Do you ever think about when you turn 48? I know you have many years to go before that happens. Oh my gosh, no, no, I didn't think about that till now. But, but. Oh my God, I've got eight years. If, you know, for anybody who's had a parent pass away, it, it's a weird thing that when you become their age, when they pass away, it's like this weird perspective that, I don't know, maybe I'm just the only one that thinks that. No, now I'm terrified. No, I didn't even think about that until you just brought it up. Oh, well, no. Great. And I'm going to go home mean, now. And <laughs> no, no, I mean, in, in, just in a way of you just see no, I mean, life right. in, in an interesting right. way. And it doesn't have to be tragic, actually. Well, interesting too, my mother was diagnosed with cancer the month after I was born at 20. And she had Hodgkin's disease, luckily, which is the most curable kind of cancer. But the amount of chemotherapy she went through in 1981 uh, has caused a lot of damage on her body now later in life. So now she's 61 and her heart is completely falling apart. She has a lot of really bad heart problems and her heart's way too damaged for a transplant or anything else like that too. So now you kind of watch that side as well and you're like, okay, you're trying to balance, you know, everything else too with that and how much time you have left with them and what you can do to, it's kind of, and as a child, you know, you're always trying to figure out what you can do to make your parents proud of you, right? Um, 
So you kind of always have that in mind too, that it's like, okay, well, if she's still here, like what can you do to be like, hey, look, I just did this thing that, you know, maybe they're impressed by. Though, you know, they don't know about everything. So it's sometimes it's hard to impress like, oh, I got this thing happened. It's like, I don't know what that is. It's like, okay, cool. <laughs> but I do remember the first time my movie came in a store and I called my dad. My dad was always, he was very skeptical of everything. And he was skeptical of like, everyone's skeptical of the film industry when their kids go into it because they don't understand it. They don't understand how it works. They don't understand there's lots of work and you can make lots of money and there's lots of different things about it. Um, I mean, it took my my wife's parents forever to figure out, I mean, I don't know, you know, they've still figured it out, like what exactly we do and how we survive. But I remember calling my dad and being like, hey, the movie came out today. He's like, oh, okay. And I was like, no, no, it's a, it's a Best Buy. You can go buy it. And he's like, what are you talking about? I'm like, no, it's on the shelf. Like, go to, you can go to Best Buy and pick it up. And he called me an hour later and he's like, you're not going to believe this. Your movie's a Best Buy. <laughs> and I'm like, I just told you that. Like, you didn't, like, you didn't believe me, I guess. And he was like, I just bought every copy. And I'm like, well, great. I know nobody else can watch it because you bought all the copies. <laughs> uh, but it's moments like that that, you know, you want, you want, of course, you want your parents to be proud of you. And, 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 my, and my mom's my biggest cheerleader. She's awesome. She's, I do a lot of horror stuff. So it's like, she can't always promote everything to her friends, but <laughs> at least now the new documentary, she can. Um, but yeah, I mean, you're always trying to find that, that approval from peers and family and, and friends and everything, I think. Do you think it made you grow up faster? I mean, just... I was, when I grew up in high school, I was the oldest of seven kids. My dad and mom divorced and remarried, and I had three step-siblings and a half-sister. And so I was the oldest of seven. So I felt then that I grew up really quickly and I always had more than one job. Like I started working at 16, not that I had to work, I just liked to work, I like to be busy. So I was working at the movie theater, the video store, the film commission and the TV station all at the same time. And in the keys, the keys are 180 miles long. People don't realize how big they are. So I was driving around four hours a day. I drive an hour north to school, two hours down to Key West to work and then an hour home every night. Um, which is fun in LA because someone's like, oh, I don't want to drive 20 minutes. I'm like, oh, I'll drive to the other side of the city. Like, it doesn't bother me. Two hour drive, sure. Um, but it's, I forget where we were going with that. Sorry. Yeah, that's funny because the people, I don't want to drive over the hill. I don't want to go over, you know, Laurel Canyon. And it's like, yeah. okay. You should have put meetings around lunchtime. It's like, <laughs> make the meetings at noon so you don't have to drive in 9 a.m. traffic. <laughs> Well, any time in L.A. is, is um, there's traffic. It's all pretty but, bad, yeah. Yeah. What else did your dad teach you in his final years? I mean, I think the things I learned most from him in those final years was that life is not guaranteed. You know, tomorrow's not guaranteed. And seeing him get more and more dehabilitated and start, once the cancer spread to his brain and he didn't really understand, like, who you were all the time or what exactly was going on all the time, I think it was really like, oh man, like you really need to get your life together and figure out how to accomplish your goals. I, I think in entertainment, people are kind of like, oh, I want to be this, but they never really think about how to be that. They just assume at some point someone calls you and you're like, hey, I saw this short film you did. You're awesome. Do you want to direct the next Avengers movie? Which of course would be amazing, but it doesn't really work that way. So you got to try to figure out how to get to the point that you want. And everyone's point's different. I mean, some people want to go and be a makeup artist on a certain television show or somebody wants to go and design props for something else. And there's different ways to do everything. There's no, there's no right way to do anything in the entertainment industry, but there are consistent ways that people have been, become successful. So I think it's really, I think one of the things that I've, learned that those last few years was to really laser focus like exactly what I wanted and then figure out the combination to be able to get to there as fast as I could. Um, he, he and I didn't always see eye to eye. He was definitely a person that didn't understand a lot. Um, like he wanted me to play football. I can't play football. I can't, I'm like the least athletic person ever. Um, but he played football, so it's like he wanted me to play football. Though he wanted to be a writer and his parents didn't want him to do that. So he had to do what his parents wanted. And luckily he didn't force that on me, but it was just kind of a, a different mentality. So you always kind of have that 
besides the creature living in your back, you have this little nagging thing that always wishes that you had a little bit more time with him, that you could have done something that he would have been impressed by. And for me, my specific one was he was always obsessed with France, with Paris. Like he loves France. He, he always he went there uh, in college, like backpacking. Like he always wanted to go back to France. And then three months after he died, our short got in the Cannes Film Festival. Oh, wow. And I'm like, that was it. That was the moment. That's the one I would have had where he would have been like, wow, you actually accomplished something. And, you know, that was taken away. And I never got to have that moment. And I feel like that will be over my head until the day I die. That one nagging thing, which is really unfortunate. But, you know, that's also something that's driving you to work harder and to get there quicker and to make it work. Because now I have a son. And I can encourage him to do what he wants to do. And he's awesome. So he's, we're literally clones of each other. Like I feel terrible for my wife. She has two of us now, but he is, he's amazing. And what the world gives now to kids is incredible because when I was a kid, I didn't have robotics programs in third grade. Like <laughs> we didn't have all these awesome programs and, and website. We didn't have websites or anything to learn from. And he can do anything he wants. Like he's he's he built his own robots at five years old, and he's gotten now he's really into molecular biology, which is interesting. He's eleven, obsessed with molecular biology, loves dissecting. He just dissected nine animals last year. Just he loves exploring and science and everything, and it's really exciting to to go on that journey with him, and encourage him to do you know whatever he wants, and hopefully, you know he won't have that moment looming over his head at some point in life that he didn't think he had made his father proud. And so that's a that's something else I learned as a father now to try to work out with my son. Mm 